when I say the word cult, you might be frightened. It might bring to mind people in strange outfits doing strange things or horrible things. You might be intrigued, trying to understand what unifies a group together. You might be repelled, scared, or you might feel pity. A cult is a complex thing. And as Mark Vincenti, uh, Nexium member and whistleblower said, we didn't join a cult. Nobody joins a cult. They join a good thing. Today on Keep It Fictional, myself and my book friends are going to talk about a subject that has intrigued me, frightened me, repelled me, and brought out pity and empathy. Something that I am always interested in, in that we are talking about cults. Now, no cult starts out being evil. And in fact, there are benign cults, and some would argue we're all part of a cult. If they were 100% evil, no one would join them. And in fact, what, a def what is defined as a cult has changed over time. So the word cult first came up in the 1600s and it was just homage paid to a divinity, offerings made. In the 1800s in the United States, there was a major religious revival, uh, different, um, different groups uh, emerged in the United States under that kind of big tent idea. And a cult was just considered new. An orthodox, uh, maybe a little bit strange, uh, a new approach to spirituality, but not evil. After the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement, the Kennedy assassinations and the counterculture movement of the 1960s, people were feeling lost. All of the institutions, all of the organizations and the government that was supposed to provide answers and guidance and goodness fell away and were found to be hollow. And in that movement, this kind of searching for spirituality and culture, counterculture grew. And in the 1960s, there was this flourishing of different religious ideas, different groups, to which the established religious order deemed as being heretical and evil. Uh, so the word began to take on a very, very different meaning. meaning. However, it was ultimately a meaning that was benign. It was just outside of the order. But all of that changed. Our understanding of what that word changed with two events. The first one being the 1969 Manson murders and the other being the 1978 Jamestown massacre. And after that, a cult became a national symbol of fear. The problem is, is that no one really actually agrees what a cult is. We don't have a working academic understanding of what a cult is. Um, so as our book friends today discuss different cults, you might see a very different definitions of it. We have words like a cult of personality, cult movies, um, cult TV shows. And in fact, that kind of word has been thrown around to attach to different things like Instagram influencers, Swifties, mommy blogs, Peloton? Is it Peloton? Pantheon? Peloton? CrossFit? We kind of have a weird sense of what cultish is without being able to define it. Manna Morell in her amazing, fantastic, my book of one of my top books of the year, uh, Cultish, the Language of Fanaticism, divides cults into two. Some of them are constructive or benign. You can be an army and there is a shared language and shared vision, but it's not necessarily poorly impacting your life in any way. But what often gets put in the media and sensationalized are these destructive cults, usually run by a narcissistic, megalomaniac, egotist, 
bent on serving their own desires. To be a part of a cult is to be human. We all yearn for connection, for identity, for ritual, for a sense of belonging. One of the biggest misconceptions about people that join cults is that they are ignorant, that they're foolish, that they're uneducated. But in fact, the studies show is that most of them are just looking to make the world a better place. So today, my book friends, Virginia, Gabriel, Mark, are going to talk about their own books related to one of the subjects that is near and dear to my heart, cults. And just as a warning, because of the innate subject matter, some of these books might be a little bit disturbing. They might contain instances of sexual abuse or um, graphic imagery. Um, we're going to try to be as respectful as possible, but if those things um, elicit a strong emotional reaction, then this episode is not for you. And that is okay. So with that in mind, we are going to delve in to this most human of desires to belong. And we are going to start with Mark. Mark, what is your cult book? Okay, thank you, Corrine. So the book I'm going to be talking about today is Cult X by Fuminori Nakamura. And I've never actually read any of Nakamura's books, but he has a bit of a, a following of his own for his sort of noir crime fiction. And I've heard some very mixed things about this book. I can kind of understand why after I've read it, there's some very strong suits to it, but also some parts that kind of started to get on my nerves after a while. <laughs> um, so just to begin, essentially, as we begin our story, we follow, we follow our main character, of course, of sorts, Toru Narazaki, who is searching for his missing ex-girlfriend. He has hired a private detective to sort of look into her to try and find out what has happened to her. And this sort of leads him to this uh, mysterious, uh, somewhat cult-like group that he believes may be a cult that congregates in an old manor around a man known as Matsuo. Um, and this Matsuo actually is not a cult leader of sorts. He's just sort of like a charismatic kind of speaker who um, allows people to stay in his manor. He organizes public speeches and uh, lectures. And these lectures are very uh, interesting. They actually include full text of them within the book itself. And Matsuo likes to talk about a lot of heavy subject matter ranging from the nature of the universe, consciousness, religion, death, and subjects like this, touching on the Buddha, Rene Descartes, Jesus, Einstein, Max Born, quantum mechanics, string theory, multiverses, neuroscience, and all kinds of other uh, related subject matter that is very, very interesting and very, so if you're into that kind of thing, that this aspect of the book was quite interesting because I find that having sort of seen the author talk about these subjects through this one character, you sort of get a better idea of why he's trying to uh, go into these kind of cult subject matter, I feel like, why people sort of are drawn to these things, what, um, how do they relate to the world itself, and things like that. So I found Matsuo to be like a kind of interesting character sort of to get uh, into this kind of cult mindset. And it's from Matsuo's followers that Narazaki starts to learn about another group that Ryoko is actually a part of. And this sort of, it's a sort of shadowy cult that no one really knows about. They don't have like a public profile. They're not really like actively advertising their existence to the world. So they sort of have been dubbed Cult X because they don't have like a formal sort of a name or anyone really knows much about them outside of their followers who come sometimes to Matsuo's lectures to try and recruit people to draw them into the sphere of their leader. And as we learn throughout the story, there's actually a deeper connection between Matsuo and the leader of Cult X, Sawatari. But just to avoid spoilers, I'm not gonna go into that too much, but just to say that they were both originally part of another spiritual group, but had a sort of falling out and they sort of split and went their separate ways into their separate groups. Now, this Sawatari, the leader of Cult X is sort of a very, very awful person. There's no real 
ways that go about saying that he's not a horrible, manipulative, uh, abusive, patriarchal sort of figurehead of this group. It sort of goes to what Crean was saying about the sort of egotistical leader who is all about his own thoughts and desires, who very much rolls with an iron fist within this group. And within uh, Cult X, later on in the narrative, we also are introduced to a high-ranking member of the group named Takahara. And he's actually sort of like a, he's a non-believer within Cult X. He sort of joined the group in order to try and co-opt the group for his own purposes, his own plotting, and to bring about the downfall of Sawatari and to uh, gain control of the group himself. And it's kind of interesting to sort of go through the different chapters because in different chapters, you get different people's perspectives. Some are told from Narazaki's perspective, some are Takahara, some are Matsuo, some are Sawatari, to see the different ways that they sort of engage with the different followers, how they sort of think about people and the world itself, how they um, go about trying to achieve their goals. Um, yeah. And so essentially, each of these different people have their own sort of aims and goals. And it's in the first half that we tend to be introduced to these people and their ideas and thoughts. In the second half, they begin to put plots into place that they start to intertwine and come into open conflict with one another. And um, there are very violent outcomes, let's say. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that just to avoid spoilers. But um, yeah. So yeah, there's these different characters. And in the later half of the book, we're also introduced to a couple more uh, outsider perspectives in, a, in the Public Defense Bureau, as they're known. It's just sort of like a, a high-ranking sort of law enforcement organization within Japan. And we sort of see these two uh, public agents as they begin to intervene within the cult and trying to uh, essentially break down the cult for their own aims and purposes of the government um, to try and maintain public order uh, support the government and all these sort of uh, more political aims of the uh, officials of the government as they view the, these sort of cults as like a threat towards the public order, towards cohesion and things like that. So we also sort of get that more official um, kind of character view of things as well. And within this story, I feel like there were a lot of interesting characters, a lot of interesting like uh, introspective thoughts so you can sort of get to learn the characters inner thoughts as well as their interactions with the different characters but at the length of this book is very long it's about 500 pages or so and I honestly felt like the characters themselves were not particularly great if I'm being honest um, <laughs> it's one of those books where if you if you're interested in sort of like this sort of cult mentality the different mentalities of these people as they sort of become embroiled within these plots and themes and things like that you may find them uh, more interesting, but I personally found them a bit too narcissistic and sort of self-centered at times. But that's sort of the different perspectives of different people. And again, I sort of, as I mentioned, there's a lot of graphic, sexual, and later on violent content in the story. So if you're not comfortable with that sort of subject matter, definitely you're not gonna want to be reading this book. So like 300 pages too long, Mark, or? <laughs> um I found the first half more interesting because it's sort of like it's sort of split in half more or less where the first half is more like the sort of setup to the different characters what their beliefs are what their sort of different relationships are and then the second half it's very much more action-based where the sort of Takahara and these different characters are putting their plots into place and it very much turns into a slightly different kind of novel in a way it's more of a thriller kind of action novel in the second half I feel like whereas the first half is more a uh, drama kind of uh ambiance or sort of feel to it I find if that makes sense I, yeah it makes sense it makes sense you get a long setup long setup and then messy messy climax all right perfect thank you all right next up is Gabriel Gabriel what is your book that you chose for this topic all right well I think and this might be the nature of uh fiction about cults but I think some elements that were present in Marx, you might sort of see appear in the book that I chose just in 
maybe a little bit of a different context and I would say probably a different feel. I don't think it was quite, um, I don't think it was intellectual in the same way that Marx was, but it had a different area uh, that it wanted to sort of explore. So this week I chose both something that fits into the theme of cults and also something that fits into one of my beloved genres, which is dark academia. I grabbed Alex Mith I grabbed Alex Michelet. <laughs> I grabbed Alex Michelades. Uh, Alex Greek name. Uh, Michelades. Alex Michelades. Second book, The Maidens, which is a mystery thriller and a crime drama that was published in 2021. The gods have willed your death is what it says in Greek in the postcard that Mariana Andros finds outside her door after another one of the maidens was murdered. That alone should give you an idea of the mood that this whole book evokes. Uh, it's one that relies very heavily on Greek mythology and stories to highlight the cult aspect of the book. Um, secret societies and dark academia kind of go hand in hand. Um, this one definitely has sort of an element of um, kind of like bacchanal rituals and revelry of the flesh. There's a little bit of that in there. Um, and I think the cult in question in the Maidens is a bit of like a cult of personality, which is one of the terms that we used earlier. Um, it both definitely has some very sort of unorthodox religious aspects, but also um, a things that were mentioned before, uh, especially in terms of like drinking and drinking insects and other things like that. But these all kind of appear a little bit in the book, although they aren't super, um, it's not, it, it doesn't super delve into them. It's more just casually sort of mentioned more in a world building sense. It's not really dwelt on so much. Um, our story is set actually at Cambridge University where the charismatic professor Edward Fosca teaches Greek tragedy to a collective of young women who follow him around him. And they are entirely women and uh, they wear white dresses. And I don't think it mentions that they walk in a phalanx, but I always assume that if you have a gaggle of Greek students, they'll walk in a phalanx like all of the old militaries did. Um, I have to assume it's just part of it. Uh, so he supplies them with alcohol and stories. Um, they study the classics with him. There are references aplenty to Persephone and her descent into the underworld, which is actually where the title of the Maidens comes from, because Persephone is the Maiden in question. Um, and when Maidens begin to drop dead, it seems like there should be a fairly obvious person to blame. So Mariana is our protagonist. She is a group therapist who is mourning the death of her husband, Sebastian. She's called to Cambridge to begin investigating mysteries by Zoe, who is one of the maidens and also Mariana's niece. Mariana immediately throws herself into the investigation, still dealing with the trauma of Sebastian's death and is very eager to assist Zoe in taking down Fosca. Um, when the maidens continue to drop dead over the course of the book and Fosca's alibi is actually accepted by the police, Mariana still continues to pursue him in the name of justice. And throughout the book, there's some, there's some really interesting elements. Uh, one of the things is that we have a lot of letters that are written by our mysterious killer, sort of providing insight into their perspective that you can put alongside Mariana's investigation. It's, one of, it's very much one of those ones where you're kind of collecting all your clues along the way. And uh, overall, it's an interesting mystery. Uh, I don't know if I was a fan of the ending, but I, I'm sure that's always a thing with um, crime drama mystery books. I don't read a ton of them. Uh, I wasn't necessarily, that wasn't why I picked this one up, although it had it and I was okay with it. It had a, a twist ending that I don't know. I don't know if it earned, but um, it's got uh, kind of a, a slow start as it sort of sets up all the clues um, and really, really goes heavy on the mood. Like this book above all else is very, very Gothic. Like, I think that would be the genre that I would think about it using because um, 
there's a lot of effort that's put into sort of the aesthetic and the vibe of like, ooh, it's Cambridge and there's Greek being thrown around like everybody can suddenly speak it. Uh, <laughs> and it's dark and sad and there's and imagery and all, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and Mariana herself is really a gothic heroine for better or for worse, in my opinion maybe for worse because gothic heroines have a lot of stuff happen to them and they just kind of have to go wow what an experience that was i wish she was a little more active in this book basically but if you like dark, dark academia and cults and murder mysteries it's it's definitely a good contender one of my favorite books of all time is the secret history by donna tart and uh I couldn't help but compare a lot of the similar elements and find this one just wasn't as fun to me. <laughs> but one thing that The Maidens does have going for it is that um, the story does explore the aspects of sort of gender and power in situations like this a, a bit more than The Secret History, which is very much uh, similar to other books in the genre, which is kind of a boys club. Like there's like maybe one female character in The Secret History, despite the fact that the author is a woman and it's supposed to be based on her own time at university um there, there's one there's one female character versus these are mostly uh this is mostly a cast of women there are quite a few notable um male characters but it does explore uh some of the interesting aspects of um yeah of the way that academia and also cults work in terms of femininity and masculinity and a lot of different elements that I I did think were actually kind of interesting so it's got that going for it and it really is a fun mood read I don't know if it's a summer mood read if you are a mood reader so this one might be some one to put on your to read list maybe in the fall when things get a little dark again because um, if the sun was shining at any point in this book it would be wrong is kind of the way it's kind of the way that I approach it uh I do not have a, a cult video game recommendation, unfortunately. I will mention my favorite cults and video games are usually not ones that are to be taken seriously, um, such as in the Borderlands series, almost everyone worships Handsome Jack, one of my favorite all-time video game characters. Um, if you were to, but it's never taken seriously. I, I don't think that's always, um, I don't think that's a plot line that's explored enough in that genre versus in books. I think you get a lot more of interesting cult content so that was my book for this week it was the maidens uh by alex uh Michelettis. excellent gabriel excellent i love how you found a book that also managed to be in your like wheelhouse of dark academia and yeah one could argue the secret history also is a cult book and a cult classic one could say. And, you know, as a mood reader, the summertime is the dark time. The summertime is when you read the most disturbing books of all. So I might actually pick that one up, even though that was a, that was a lukewarm, <laughs> lukewarm plug. But I'll accept it. All right. Well, we are going to go into our existential question uh, next. And I, I am curious to know, uh, among here and in Amanda Morell's books, again, she makes the argument because we don't have a working definition of what a cult really is, is that a lot of organizations, groups, uh, fans are in fact cults. They have a shared language. Um, they kind of work together. Uh, she makes it, they have a passion or interest that they all share and a, a vision of, of what a, a, a good, happy future would look like. So she kind of argues that uh, fandoms can be cults, sports groups, sports fans, um, sometimes just relationships or a cult of one, um, any organization, even a workplace in some ways can be a cult. We've heard things about Amazon we've heard. Um, so I'm curious, uh, have you ever belonged to, uh, have you ever been like a very, very big fan of something and included with it? I'm going to go straight to Gabriel. I thought you were going to straight up ask, have you ever been in a cult? Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think I talked about this before, uh, at least at one point on um, Keep It Fictional, but I am someone who doesn't read that often because when I do really get into reading, and I mean that outside of the keep it fictional stuff, 
um, when I do really get into reading, it is a case that I have to let it consume me. I don't think that I can, when people ask me, do I want to watch a new TV show? I'm not just budgeting the time for watching a new TV show. I'm budgeting the time for watching it a couple more times. And I'm budgeting the time for how long it's going to take me to read at least a few separate books worth of fan fiction. And so usually when I'm considering getting into a story, I have to kind of think of all that stuff. Do I have the emotional range to be able to accept this into my life right now? I think that I'm always in at least one fandom or another. So I care very deeply about things. Um, I read the Thrawn book and then I continued to read Thrawn books past the point in which they were published straight into the unpublished fan fiction realm and continued on. So yes, I care a lot about things that I go into. Um, and that's usually just the way that I consume media. Perfect. To be a fan is to care deeply. So that's perfect. All right, Mark, what about you? Um, I think there have been a few sort of video game and anime related fandoms I could say I've been into in the past, but one that's sort of more uh, enduring over time probably would be like sports, since like the Vancouver Canucks and certain other sports teams I've followed for many, many years. You start to get like a kind of connection to it. If you see like you're going to a game, you're in a crowd of like 20,000 people you're cheering for your favorites you're like the people are going to lead you to victory and like whatnot like that's very almost cult like I feel like you're going to like this giant rally with all these other people and watching it happen live things like that like that almost in a way kind of has that aspect to it um but yeah I think that would probably be like the biggest one for me it would be sports uh and the Vancouver Canucks what is being a fan of the Vancouver Canucks, but to be in a cult of hope, one could argue. Uh, Virginia, what about you? I feel like I have been a fan of things, but I don't, I like to do it in a very personal, like it's my own way. I, I don't, I'm not the kind to connect with, like, you know, if I'm like deeply into whatever it is, I, I'm not into like connecting with other people about it. In fact, I, try to avoid doing that <laughs> um so you know all the things that i have loved is more like just for myself like i don't need the other people and i feel like sometimes you know like when you enjoy like you know like Gabriel Tomo, like enjoying a tv show i don't want to read anything about it i don't i don't care i don't care other people's theories i am not interested i just want to be able to immerse myself in that i don't yeah so i feel like that's me with this fan thing um I, I think the first thing that came to mind was probably Pokemon but again like big fan of Pokemon but it's my own like I don't <laughs> I've been to like when when they were had the championship in Vancouver I remember going there I'm just like this is weird I don't like it um and I feel like that's that's my every time I go to I'm like I don't like this I don't like well I don't like crowds that's the other thing too so that doesn't help when it's all and sometimes I just feel like people are so passionate about it and it scares me so um yeah that is is very fair uh, yeah, I've been a fan of things since I was very young. I think my very first fandom was the X-Files. Um, and I passionately, deeply cared about the X-Files. See, yeah, Virginia, you're nodding. You understand. You understand. But also, I, I, I'm not a joiner. I, I like to enjoy things like from my own house, um, except for going to concerts, because of course, I'm BTS Army, and that's fine. I will go to concerts, but I'm not there. To, I'm there to enjoy it in my own, my own time in my own space. But Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. See, everyone, everyone just wants to be and believe in something. Believe in something. That's all we want. All right. Um, I think I will go next. Um, and I'm gonna take a dive into nonfiction because that is is usually what I like to to read about on this particular subject. And this is probably a book about one of the most infamous cults of all time, certainly one of the most destructive ones. And it actually was the, the history that kind of precipitated my interest in this. I remember for a long time, there was and is the joke or the common saying of someone drank the Kool-Aid. 
And I didn't understand what that meant. I, I understood what the meaning of it was in that it meant to kind of like blindly believe in something or to kind of swallow what someone is saying to you. Um, but I didn't really understand what the connotations of it was or what the history of it was. Um, it wasn't until I happened to be watching TV and a documentary came up by Stanley Nelson. Um, and it is Jonestown, the life and death of the People's Temple. And watching that really excellent documentary that I really, really understood what had happened there. Um, not only the tragedy around uh, what had happened to those people, but the kind of media frenzy and aftermath and turning someone's tragedy into a joke or into a saying. And um, as uh, Joanelle Smart, uh, who lost four children, her mother and her uncle in Jonestown says, um, she says, when someone says that kind of saying, like, it still hurts every time I hear it. I hate that people laughed when they said it, like something happened was somehow funny. And another uh, really good thing about this is that that's all that people remember about this. They remember that particular saying or, or that fabricated thing, and they don't remember what the people involved with it were actually striving for, why they actually joined something like this, is that they were looking for equality. They were looking for a better world and a better place, but that's not what gets remembered. Um, so this is kind of the story that has always intrigued me about cults, about cults of personality, and I think kind of drives to the heart of why people are interested in this subject is that it is a, a fear. It is a fear of being manipulated. It's a fear of losing yourself or losing control over your own life. Um, and it's the fear of the impact or influence that other people can have on your own life and your own decisions and even your own mind. Um, I think that kind of drives to the heart of a lot of people's interest in cults because there is that fear and you feel like the more you learn about it, the more you try to understand the why and the how, the better protected you will be against it. But that's not possible. That, that just isn't. Um, you can't protect yourself against manipulation or loss of control in your life. Um, the people that um, that are interested in kind of starting those destructive cults, that, that that is their skill. They're not smarter or better or more interesting than anyone else. They just have a skill. They have a skill of manipulation and that's it. And I think that stripping away kind of like the sensationalism and the media narrative of, of what happens in these particular scenarios is really important because we build up these people, these, these characters as, as being somehow superhuman when they were just people, horrible people. And I think that um, the book that I read does a really good job of being factual, being matter of fact about what had happened and not trying to speculate on the psychology of it, but being factual about this person's life and their decisions and also the, the tragedy of the victims um, and, and why they had kind of found themselves there and making you feel very empathetic to them. Um, again, I had this preconceived notion that in order to be kind of taken in by someone, you had to be weak, that you had to be foolish that you had to be easily suggestible and that's really not the case like all these people want is again as amanda montel says like is this very human connection they want to make the world a better place they see the injustices in the world they see the inequality um in the case of jonestown they saw the economic and the racial inequality in the united states and they wanted to do something about it they wanted to live in a better world. They wanted to, if they had to make that better world. And here is someone who is kind of leading them on, leading them on and saying, I can make this better world for us. We can do this together. I just need your cooperation. Um, Jeff Gwynn um, has written a really, 
I think kind of one of the best books that I've read on the subject, which is The Road to Jamestown, Jim Jones and the People's Temple, where he looks at the life and history of Jim Jones, um, looks into the lives of the victims, uh, looks into um, kind of the larger historical and social issues that were going on at the time. Um, he looks at the particular area that the People's Temple kind of flourished in um, to the point where politicians would endorse Jim Jones because he was really making a difference in, in, the, in the issues of, of social justice in the community and in civil rights. And he talks about how, yes, at the beginning, Jim Jones was really interested in kind to try to bridge the economic and racial divides in the United States, how he really was an advocate for poor African Americans and really did see how they were being tried, treated by society and wanted to do something about it, and how that slowly got corrupted um, through power, through drugs, through influence, until it turned out to where it is. The majority of this book is kind of focused on that history of the people's uh, people's temple, and then the last section of it kind of deals with the massacre again in a very um, empathetic and factual way. But it is incredibly disturbing. Um, there are images and there are stories in this that that are not for everyone, not for everyone at all. Um, I would say if you are interested in this and want someone who has clearly done the research and is approaching it from a very I would say respectful point of view of trying to understand, um, then this is a, a really excellent book to start on because that is for me, my interest in this particular subject is I want to understand. I, I don't understand and I want to. Um, and I think that, that if you are centering the history and the victims in this particular instance that there is a way to do that respectfully without sensationalizing it. And I think that Jeff Gwynn does a, a really, really good job of it. Um, so yeah, if you are interested in the subject, um, and again, go in with the knowledge that this is, that this is a story with a horrible end. 918 people died. And I think that's sometimes what gets lost in a joke or in a saying that we don't really understand the history of is that 918 people died because of the direction of one person, of one man. And so the hope is, is that if we can understand it, if we can pick it apart dispassionately without getting caught up in the narrative or that history of personality, is that in the hopes that maybe one day we can stop this from happening again. So that is The Road to Jamestown, Jim Jones and the People's Temple by Jeff Gwynn. All right, that is my, my nonfiction plug, my nonfiction story. I, there are so many to choose from, um, but, but this one really took me back to, to why I'm interested in it. And now we're going to switch over to a fiction story for Virginia. Virginia, what do you have for us? And so this week, I am also going to take our topic to space because everything is better in space, uh, probably. Um, so I've got for you Salvation Day by Kelly Wallace. Jazz Swinda or Jazz is sitting on a spaceship traveling to one of the moons for his postgraduate research project, along with his best friend, his classmates and his professor. When one of them suddenly said, hey, look, what is that? Everyone's attention turned towards what the student was pointing at. And from the windows, they can see that there's this huge object outside. Jazz took one look and he knows what they're looking at. Even though he couldn't believe this is what they're looking at. That is the house of wisdom. A now abandoned ship, but once home of 428 people, including Jazz and his parents a place he calls home for almost 10 years. But now everybody on board is dead and Jess is the only survivor. All the people were killed by a virus unleashed upon them by a scientist who was fired and decided to take revenge on them. Jess remembers clearly the day that his mother and he went back to the room and they found their father inside and his mother tried to calmly ask his father, 
Vinod, what are you doing with the knife? And his father, upon seeing his wife and his son, rushed into the bathroom and locked himself in with the knife. His father has been infected. And having seen what this virus did to others on board, he wanted to make sure that he's not going to endanger his family. So he decided to bar himself in and take matters into his own hand. His mother, also recognizing that her husband has been infected, dragged Jess away from the room to her lab, and she forced him into one of those small experimental spacecraft that she has been working on. And Jess remembers trying to resist, trying to say, no, I don't want to go. And his mother said, no, 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 this is no longer safe on the ship. You need to go now. And I will follow, I promise, right away, okay? Just please. And of course, his mother never did. She died along with the other 427 people. Jess doesn't understand why he's seeing the House of Wisdom right now, right outside the spaceship, because the moon that they are supposed to go to is nowhere near it, but that's where the House of Wisdom is right there. Well, it's because Sarah has changed the flight path. She and the crew has been training and preparing for this mission for years. And for years, she has been separated from her family just for this, but they're almost there. Their mission is to hijack the ship that they're on, fly to the House of Wisdom, get on board, make sure the ship is safe, restart the system, take control. And in the meantime, the homestead, another ship has been sailing also towards the House of Wisdom, waiting for Sarah's signal and her confirmation that it is safe to proceed. On the homestead are hundreds of people, all of Sarah's family and including her siblings. Their group has been living in the desert for a while, guided by Adam, their leader. After the collapse, there are certain, there are only certain areas on earth that is safe to live in. And these areas are all controlled by the council. And to live there, you have to become a citizen. But not everybody agrees with the council. Not everybody wants to bend to the council. So many people decide to just find a way to survive in the desert instead. Adam, their leader, has seen that in his vision that this living in the desert is not going to be sustainable. They need to look to the sky. They need to look to space for a new home. The government, the council, they have been hiding all kinds of secrets from the people and everything they say, including what happened to the House of Wisdom, is a lie. He knows better. The ship is going to be the future. That is where they can settle and it will have everything they need and they will be safe and they won't have to live under the council anymore. And so it is imperative that Sarah and her family members succeeded in their mission so they can have a place to live. But there's another reason why Sarah is so determined to get on board the House of Wisdom. Her father is Dr. Gregory Lagos, and he is the scientist that has unleashed the virus on the House of Wisdom. Sarah needs to know why. She needs to know what happened. And she thinks like if she can just get to the ship, she'll be able to find answers. But despite what Adam's vision has been telling him, despite what he thinks he knows about the what the government is hiding, and despite Jazz's countless replays of all the final communication and messages that were sent from the House of Wisdom to Earth, none of them knows that the people were not killed by a virus. They were killed by something else. And as they board the House of Wisdom, and trying to restart the ship. And that's the reason why they needed Jess Winder because he is the only one left that can able to get them access to certain things on the ship so they can restart it again. But as they board the ship, they didn't know that they have also at the same time woken something else up. One of my favorite genre mashup is horror and science fiction. I mean, when you put something scary, something that goes bump in the night on a spaceship, it just is much scarier because there's nowhere to go in space. You can't just leave. And in a book, 
not in the real life. In a book, I just really enjoy that very claustrophobic kind of feeling when you're stuck on a ship with who knows what. And spaceships are also a perfect setting for another one of my favorite tropes, which is locker room mysteries. And Salvation Day definitely has that. Again, spaceship, nowhere to go is perfect for that. And of course, on top of all the scary things, who knows what they're trying to survive, this mysterious thing that is lurking on a spaceship. And, and of course, uncovering all the lies that you have been told with Jess, um, trying to find out what the government has been hiding with Sarah, trying to find out what Adam hasn't really told them. On top of all of that, there is a cult, a leader who is manipulating everyone so that he could get what he wants. And he's taking advantage, I think very much like what Kareem was talking about in the introduction, those basic human needs. You just want to belong. You want to find a place that is safe. And he is taking advantage of that. And in this case, it's even more so than just that sense of belonging because many of the people here, they are refugees. After the collapse of Earth, they have nowhere to go. They're trying to get into those safe zones. But for some reason, they're application is just taking forever and they can't get in and they keep getting stopped and so what Adam can offer them seems so much more promising and Adam is making and taking advantage of that and Adam rules by fear on the one hand everybody is afraid of Adam they have seen his fits of rage and they're scared that he would be mad at them and so they are desperate to make sure that they can succeed in this mission but at the same time Sarah and everybody else just desperately also want his approval they're craving for his affection they nobody wants to disappoint Adam and and that sort of dynamics um is, is explored in the book um and which makes it like I think like like Corinne said you, you're trying to understand sort of what what why people would join a group um and also understand that it is like Corinne said not because they are weak not because they don't know any better but there's something deeper than that um so a great thriller it's got everything it's got mystery it got space it got suspense and give you can stomach just a bit well i don't know just a bit maybe it's an understatement but uh, then i think this would be a really good read for you it is salvation day by kelly wallace fantastic thank you virginia i love that you managed to fulfill the brief in space. I love it, I love it. So to kind of close, um, Amanda Montel argues in her amazing book, Cultish, that a cult is of all about the power of language. Again, most people join a group like this out of their own free will, convinced by the words of others. Language can make people feel unique and special and individual and connected to other people. Language can also make you dependent on a leader for their approval, for their, sometimes your even survival. And language can also convince people to act in ways that are completely in conflict with their former reality, ethics, and sense of self. Most of what these leaders or these groups do is through the power of language. It can both make you a part of a group and close you off to others. It can make you feel belonging, but it can also set up a divide between us who speak the language and them who don't. To, manip to manipulate language means that you can convince people to buy things, to join, to attack to ostracize, to abandon, and to believe. And you're doing all of this with the power of language. It can again make you act in ways that are contrary to what you believed of yourself. Reading these stories and being aware of who and what and how people are trying to influence your behavior can only give you the tools to ensure that you are being true to yourself. Cults ask us to be skeptical, to ask questions. Don't take things at face value. Interrogate them. Interrogate others. Interrogate yourself. 
It teaches us how to be aware of how manipulation and the manipulation of language works. Because as Amanda Montel writes, tuning into the rhetoric these communities use and how its influence works for both good and not so good can help us participate. And I would say help us choose to participate or not, however we choose with clearer eyes. So thank you so much to all of my book friends for indulging me on this topic. And um, we hope that, that this has maybe changed some of your preconceived notions about what a cult is or what a cult can be. So thank you so much and happy reading everyone. Thank you.